Thanks for joining us once again at the Clive Barker Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the works and worlds of Clive Barker. This is episode 138, A to Z and the Duels of Blood, Part 2. Uh, we come clean about our April Fool's prank uh, story and go over the results of round one of the Duels of Blood and start into round two. Uh, we talk, talk a, l- a little bit about Nicholas Vince's new Kickstarter and we have some, and there's some news about the Midnight Meat Train movie. Uh, then we go on to our main topic, which is, again, Clive Barker's A to Z of Horror, both the book edited by Stephen Jones and the BBC TV series. Uh, this is part two, so we're covering the letters D, E, and F. Uh, and there's a link in the show notes over at uh, for this episode over at CliveBarkerCast.com, where you can watch the, the TV series as well. One more thing before we get going. I want to brag a little bit about our friend of the show and contributor, Don Bertram. Uh, Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination Shop is dedicated to benefiting the arts and medicine program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. Up to 50% of the proceeds will support the program where artist Don Bertram volunteers monthly. Uh, Please join us in donating to the program at Texas Children's Cancer Center. There's a link in the show notes and on the main website at CliveBarkerCast.com that will take you where you need to go to get one of his prints, or art books, and help out this wonderful program. Any friend of Clive Barker's is a friend of ours, and we thank him for his support. Hey, welcome to episode 138 of the Clive Barker Podcast. As usual, uh, I'm Joe, and uh, we got Ryan here. Hey! And today we're going to be talking about A to Z of Horror and the Duels of Blood Part 2. Uh, or maybe I should say Volume 2, Round 1. <laughs> yeah. It's going to get complicated. Yeah. This well, is like Half-Life. It's going to be Half-Life yeah. Episode 1, Part, you know, yeah. uh, Half-Life 2, Episode 1, and Episode 2. Anyway, so that was my nerd p- moment of the podcast. <laughs> so uh, you want to start with some feedback? Yeah, we had a couple of um, couple of episode uh, feedback that we got on, on Facebook. Martin D. Ford, this is about Episode 136. Uh, which was A to Z, our last A to Z of horror episode. He said, uh, great episode. If you want to read a, go- a great biography on Ed Gein, I highly suggest Deviant by Harold uh, Sch- Schechter. Uh, also, Gein doesn't qualify as a serial killer because you have to kill three or more persons. Oh, okay. So there's uh, a technic- technicality, I guess, there. Did not know that. Yeah. Um, he he was more of a grave digger than a, a murderer, I guess. He did he did kill some people, like like we talked about on the other show. Yeah. Funny thing is that Barbie Wild, when we had her on, I I didn't realize that Barbie Wild was so uh, uh, fascinated with serial killers. You remember when we were talking to her on the on the podcast? Oh yeah, yeah. And when and, she wrote uh, the Venus Complex. And uh, before she wrote that, I think at uh, Monster Mania, um, at, I, I I sat at a table with her in. in uh, at a in a bar, I think with with um, Kristen Francis, and we just talked about. They mostly talked about serial killers for a long time because um, I don't really know that much about them. But oh yeah, I forgot to ask you this on the other episode for A to Z of horror. But you once told me the story that uh, one of your friend's mothers had like a serial killer for a gardener for a while. Oh no, it was actually my my mother. Um, okay, it, it, uh, Ted Bundy was her paper boy. Wow, yeah. isn't that isn't that something? Yeah, wow. she, so they would have been one of those people that said he seemed like such a nice person. Uh huh. If well, if they'd been asked, <laughs> the Bundy boy. Yeah. All right, and we have another one uh, feedback from David Anderson, who has been with us on the podcast before. He says the in depth analysis of Buddy Vance's story arc earned a solid <laughs> howl of laughter from me. <laughs> Well done on the matchups. Yeah. Thank you, David. That, now that's that, true. That was where we said uh, he's the guy that, that was, was jogging and he fell in a hole. And died. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he said, I thought Clive's ideas in this script – oh, he's talking about the uh, Great Unknown script yeah. that we discussed in the last episode. Mm-hmm. I think Clive's ideas in this script would have been better served as a 12-episode season on TV. It's a bigger roller coaster ride than Nightbreed. There is the coolest monster I've ever imagined, and Clive just keeps going. Indiana Jones on acid is a good description. It had <laughs> tremendous amounts of creativity and momentum. I'd like that comic, too. One disagreement with Jose. I love on the threshold of another world ending. He used it in his next movie instead, two people starting another adventure beneath a field of stars. The lack of a sequel to this one would have been even w- more devastating, though. Okay, yeah, I, well, sure. 
I understand. Um, I'd, st- I'd still rather have it than not, though. Sure. I mean, it's a very satisfying ending, you know, where uh, uh, Harry Damore, you know, finds love and uh, moves on to another dimension with his uh, interdimensional love interest. I just thought it was a little, you know, too much. But, uh, yeah, you're right. The Nightbreed ending is kind of sugary as well. I mean, I'm okay with that for some reason because has more of a – like Russell Charrington used to say, uh, Nightbreed has uh, gone with the wind with monsters. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So you kind of expect yeah. that uh, moment on the hill. He, he kind of the, introed the, all of the screenings of the Cabal Cut with that. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. And I, I – you know, the script had really great monsters, the Moffrey and uh, the Realm Qua. All, the, all those monsters were just amazing. Uh, it definitely was a cool uh, – I hope you guys listened to that episode. It's a really good script, and we kind of break down the story for you guys. So, And uh, in Clive Barker news, actually, this one is – this is one of ours. I had an April Fool's a post that I was a little disappointed with the results of it because – Online, almost nobody commented. I mean, I think one person put wrote like "ha ha" or something, but most everybody just kind of liked it. So I didn't really get it, get an idea about. Well, if you just click on like on Facebook, I, I don't know if they got that it was a joke or. Um, and I I had one sort of unfortunate result because one of the one of the people that I named as a as a um, one of the introductions on the book. Uh-huh. Uh, actually took it seriously and she said I didn't know if I just forgot or you know I don't know I, I, this is the first I've heard of this and what's this oh, about? Oh what and, the, the professor the teacher yeah, in uh, yeah, Peggy o- o- O'Leary yeah <laughs> we so, got one yeah 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 we got one yeah but um, I think she was a little bit sad about it when, when I explained she thought that, that the Scare Baby book was going to also include so just to kind of back up, I guess, the April Fool's joke was that I said, oh, we've got new details about the Clive Barker book Scare Baby. It turns out it's not a novel. It's uh, a printing of the poem with two introductions, one by Peggy O'Leary and one by Phil and Sarah Stokes and a, an a original painting by Clive Barker of the Scare Baby. Yeah, the Scare Baby that was a poem from Aberat. Yeah. And so, so basically, you're, yeah, you're kind of making fun of – a little fun of uh, of the special editions that keep coming out where they have one story or two stories in there and they turn it into a limited edition hardcover. Yeah. But they they jam-pack that stuff always full of like goodies like you know yeah. manuscript pages like The Thief of Always and stuff. So but this would this, have been a yeah. hardback of a, of a one-page poem. <laughs> so – that is that is funny. So yeah, I noticed that there weren't a lot of people calling out on on this being legit or an April Fool's joke, like you yeah. said. And I was a little disappointed. I was yeah. expecting people being like, "Ah, you guys were trying to trick me." Yeah, I mean, I, I I didn't know if people would 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 catch on or not, but um, really, people just kind of like, "Oh, okay." One of the funny things that you did with this April Fool's joke is that announcing that it was going to be this this poem from Everett, you actually put the whole poem. On the, uh, yeah, right. so there would be no point to buying the book if yeah. it was real, you know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, was... scare baby, scare baby, where do you run? Out in the graveyard to have you some fun, dancing with skeletons up from the ground, doing a jig on the burial mound, and then it goes on for like yeah. two more stanzas. But uh, uh, g- good joke. Uh, <laughs> if anybody believed it, it was April Fool's joke. So yeah. we got yeah. you. Scare baby, from all we know, is still going to be a young adult novel by Clive Barker coming out sometime probably 2018. Yes. And I said April 1st on 2018 and one person did comment. They're like, uh, April 1st, 2018 is a Sunday and books never come out on a Sunday. And wow. Like, you, really, <laughs> yeah. you really looked into it. Wow. Yeah. It's like, I would have thought that somebody would have caught that it was a hardcover of a one page poem before they noticed that. But, Next time you have to say it's coming out on February 30th. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or to be more, you know, subtle, you could say like uh, 31st of April or something yeah. like that. On the 25th the... hour. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so April so, Fools. Yeah, April uh, Fools. Let us know uh, what you think of it. And sometimes we even got people like Mark Miller on our previous uh, uh, April Fools jokes, right? Yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah. We had a, we had a really big one two years ago with, uh, 
when we when we announced that there was a one year delay on on the Scarlet Gospels, which was <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> they got a lot of people angry. Yeah. Yeah, the publishers at St. Martin's Press got upset, you know, and they wanted to know where this news was coming from because it's not true, and they wanted yeah. Mark to, to crack down on it and find find out, uh, you know, and, and put a stop to it. And Hashtag fake news. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually, wouldn't it be nice if fake news was only on April Fool's Day now? I know. It would be amazing. Yeah. Uh, that way you could just... Uh skip the news on april 1st and you you, you know you would yeah. get away from all the stuff that just keeps popping up you just check out the aftermath on on april 2nd yeah see all the foaming people on youtube complaining yeah. about things yeah uh and their uh recliners drinking beer and watching fox news anyway uh so what else do we got here we got uh joe blow uh pointed out that midnight meat train is now available on netflix yeah. So uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, that, there's a chance if you have Netflix. Yeah, that would be kind of cool. Um, just to, it's nice to see that to see a, a wide uh, to see that spread out to a wider audience after what happened to it in the movie theaters. Yeah, other horror movies have been hitting Netflix again, like Nightmare on Elm Street, Gremlins, and Escape from New York. So uh, I mean, there used to be that podcast with Andrew Furtado. Yeah, right. Now the speaking. editor of the yeah. the editor of the director's cut of Nightbreed, and he used to have a podcast where he talked about the things that were uh, leaving Netflix and and coming on Netflix. Mm -hmm. But I think that podcast is now over. So uh, yeah. I, I don't know. Do you guys know a website where you can know what's going to hit Netflix and what's leaving Netflix? That would be really useful for people who have Netflix. Yeah, and like yeah. just a comprehensive li list that's updated would be kind of nice. Send us a link. It's hard to trust that stuff. I mean, there are people that I know people that just give up on buying movies and they just like, oh, I'll just see them on Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever. But you have no way of knowing what's going to be there and what's not going to be there. And on Amazon Prime, sometimes things are free and sometimes that you have to pay for them. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I mean, I just I just like having my Blu-rays. Oh sure, yeah. There's nothing. There's nothing that tops the experience of having the physical media, in my yeah. opinion, because they're always there. You, they're never going to be taken away. Yeah. You know, pretty much during your lifetime, as long as you have a Blu-ray player, you're going to be able to watch it. Mm -hmm. So there's there's nothing better than that. I hate the like the online digital stuff where it's like you don't know if they're going to take it out. You don't know if the website is going to last ten years or it's going to yeah. fold in five years. So uh, yeah, like. Uh, that's that's the bad thing about it. Well, like uh, the four times that I've watched Hellraiser Revelations, two of those times I think I rented it on iTunes, mm -hmm. and then then the next time it was gone. Yeah, or or computer games that are always online, or computer games that are multiplayer, and then they oh, yeah. quit the servers and they drop the servers, and that's it. You have a game you can't play anymore. Yeah, because nobody plays it, or there's no servers to play it, which is horrible. I, I wish that companies would stop doing that. I think that's because... driving up the value of retro games that don't do stuff like that, because those games are worthless when you know when their servers are gone. Yeah. Anyway, Midnight Meat Trains on Netflix. It was directed by yeah. Riwei Kitamura. It stars Bradley Cooper, Leslie Bibb, Brooke Shields, Roger Bartz, Ted Raimi, and Vinnie Jones. And the script was adapted by Jeff Bueller. And you can find the script, I think, on the Midnight Meat Train hardcover that yeah. came out a few years ago. So that's that's a good uh, a good book to have. A lot of cool stuff in there. A lot of like paintings from Clyde Barker. Yeah. And a friend of the show, um, and he's been on our show two or three times, Nicholas Vince, mm -hmm. is, uh, has a, a Kickstarter for two short movies that are short films that he wants to make. One is called Your Appraisal, and the other one is called Necessary Evils. It's, uh, he's asking for 1,500 pounds, and yeah. he's already went way over that. He's almost at uh, twice as much. He's at 2,934 pounds. Uh, with 54 backers and 13 days to go. So there's almost almost two weeks to go uh, if you want to back the project. And uh, your appraisal is a nasty tale of a boss who, during their appraisal meeting, tortures his employee with office stationery. <laughs> uh, the Stenobites. Yeah. Uh, in oh, Necessary yeah. Evils, a soldier discovers the army really does own him, body and soul. So those are the two short films that he has written, and he will direct them. 
uh, working with the production company Celtic Badger Media. I like that name. Mm. It's a really cool name. Celtic Badger. Yeah, if you watch the video on the Kickstarter, it's got this this badger wearing like um, wearing like um, Irish war gear or Scottish. Oh, really? Yeah, that's awesome. And they're gonna film the film in uh, Limerick, Ireland, at the beginning of June with practical effects. Cool. So uh, maybe they'll collaborate with uh, Rawhead Rex. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and, and dinners I, on the table. I was a little shocked when when I saw that went up and and that his goal was fifteen hundred pounds. I thought, who would start a Kickstarter with such a low goal? And then I thought, oh wait a minute, <laughs> we, we did that two years. That's in a right. Row. Yeah, we start with super low goals. Yeah, I, I like you said. Yeah, it's true. When you think about, they're going to be two shorts. I mean, he's almost at three thousand pounds. Yeah, um, they're going to be definite low budget shorts. I mean, even for a short. Sometimes uh, they can be pretty expensive. So, um, hey, let's see what what they can come up with. But he's banking on uh, banking on people probably going over the goal, and he's already started creating stretch goals, which is pretty cool. Yes, and let's be honest, it's Nicholas Vince, uh, accomplished author, uh, famous actor. Well, famous, yes, famous. I would say famous in in the horror genre. Yeah. So uh, here you go. You have all these like cool. Uh, cool things you can get if you pledge you know 15 pounds give you digital links uh 25 pounds gives you the digital extra bundle and you know if you want oh you can get a skype call from from uh, nicholas vince Mm. if you pledge 35 pounds or more and he'll send you a signed photo and it goes on and on so awesome that's really nice really nice he even has like the posters for the shorts already made and uh, we've been sharing it on our Facebook page, so you may have seen this uh, on our Facebook page before. And uh, I hope you guys will uh, contribute something to this. Yeah. And speaking of Kickstarter, we um, just a, a quick update on, on ours for the people who contributed. I, I just recently shipped out all of the stuff that I have at this moment. So anybody that ordered um, one of the posters, well, you know, one of the single one-off posters, not the ones that we have a lot of. Um, right. Th- those all went out. Uh, Imagica cards went out. Um, the the a couple of books all all got shipped out. Um, and I've updated almost everybody with their tracking numbers. I still have one uh, one receipt that I got to punch in all the numbers and email people with. But um, but yeah, and we're, the t-shirts are arriving here on Friday as we're recording this. Um, this this episode will probably come out Sunday, so that means. By that time, we'll have the T-shirts and probably be ready to start shipping those out. I'm looking uh, forward to those. Yeah, I'm looking forward to those. I will also have right here next to me on the desk, there were seven posters, seven tubes of posters that I'm going to drop in the, the post office. And uh, they have some of the smi- Don't Trust the Smiling World posters and, and, and a few other things. I love that So, one. yeah, it's really cool. It's very rare. Uh, it, it was made by the Century Guild, but then, you know, they – they stopped representing Clive, so they had all this stuff that they couldn't really do anything with. So they they sent us some copies of these, and uh, yeah, we we may have some other posters for next year because yeah. we had about a hundred on the pot on the Kickstarter, but uh, unfortunately we didn't sold we didn't sell all a hundred posters, which would have been great, but uh, that just makes them more rare. Yeah, yeah, and it'll be it'll be a nice thing to 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 have to you know that if. Anybody's interested, just we'll. I'm sure they'll be available um, from us and you know other other times. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And also, a cool thing is that all the podcast episodes have recently been restored into the feed, uh, thanks to Ryan's hard work. So uh, I think now, if someone uh, Ryan, if someone subscribes to us on iTunes, are they going to be able to get all episodes from episode one? Yeah, you can scroll all the way down to episode one and, and listen to us talk for three hours on, on our first episode. Jeez, and, I can't and, even imagine yeah. and we how were, many hours are represented in all 138 episodes plus audio commentaries and specials. And we had um, and we had music in there that we probably should not have put into the podcast. <laughs> I think then. it's safe now. Yeah, yeah. So you got you got a lot to catch up on. If this is your first episode of the podcast of the Barker Cast, then you have a lot to catch up on. Go on iTunes. You can also find us on Google Play and all sorts of like you know wherever good podcasts are served. 
I, and I'm, I'm kind of glad that if, if you haven't started with episode number one, I'm kind of glad that you're hearing this first because our audio quality was not the best when we started. Um, oh goodness. Yeah. I was one, I was using one of those like $10 yeah. headsets with a little microphone. And so, sometimes I use the one built into the laptop mm -hmm. and, uh, sometimes I would use the, um, I would, I would use that Zoom microphone, and I would have the have it set wrong so that it would be recording out of the wrong side of it. Oh, gosh. Well, we have gone a long way. Uh, <laughs> we have some much, much better audio quality nowadays thanks to yeah. our Kickstarter backers and thanks to all the support over the years. And, yes, I think we also figured out how to stutter less, how to use less, like, ums and ahs. You know, it's always like a work in progress. Yeah. So that leads us into the duels of blood. So we've talked about we've talked about this on every episode for the last couple here, but um, go over to duelsofblood.com. No spaces or hyphens or anything. D u e l s o f b l o o d dot com. Uh, duelsofblood.com and round one is over. So our first matchup in the Aberat bracket was Abraham Hollow versus Diamanda, and Diamanda took it. Yes, they're both from the 25th hour of the Aberat, uh, correct? Yeah, yeah. Right, so Diamanda won this one, so she moves on to round two of voting. And Abraham and, Hollow uh, is going to have to stay in the 25th hour. Yeah, he's going to have to stay there. Um, next one, we had John Mischief versus Malingo. Malingo is, of course, Candy's uh, friend throughout the whole adventure. And uh, for this one, yes, uh, you were talking about uh, on the other episode how John Mischief is kind of cheating because he's more than one person. It's him <laughs> and his brothers. <laughs> yeah. uh, but he took it. He he yeah. won this this uh, battle against uh, Malingo, which means that Malingo is going to uh, just uh, take a back seat now. He's probably going to hang out with Candy for a while. I was going to say something, but I didn't want to spoil um, Aberat 3 because you haven't read it yet. No, I haven't. That's right. Um, so then after that, we've got Mendelssohn Shape versus Otto Houlihan. So these are both uh, assassins from uh, Christopher Carrion. And uh, Mendelssohn Shape won it by actually quite a bit. Um, he's got those cool swords with the, built, the scabbards that are built into his back. And uh, he also, um, Scare Baby is his favorite uh, nursery rhyme when he was a child. I like this one. I voted for him. I voted for Mendelssohn's shape because I, I like him as a character more than uh, the crisscross man. Yeah. Because I think at the beginning of the second volume, you kind of get this idea that Otto Houlihan is not as badass as he makes himself out to be. Because yeah. he gets a little scared when he's waiting for an audience with uh, uh, Christopher Carrion. Yeah. In the antechamber, there's a couple of characters there. Um, um, I forgot the names of them. Um Oh, gosh. Anyway, it's so they, they kind of poke they kind of poke fun at him a little bit, and he gets kind of intimidated. So I always thought that Mendelssohn's shape is a much more scary looking character. Yeah. Also, he's he's missing a foot, so he he walks on his stump. That's right. Is, yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of weird. I, and you mentioned that those things in his back are swords. Yeah, I always I always thought those were more like uh, wings, like these weird uh, uh, skeletal wings. But yeah, yeah, you're probably right. They're swords, I guess. I'd have to go back and read it again. That, that's that's my memory of it anyways, that those are swords. And he's got these built-in sort of flesh scabbards on his back. Yeah. So two smaller characters, uh, Tuto Tom and Dodo. Yeah. Uh, wow, this one actually uh, got a lot of votes. <laughs> yeah. um, Dodo won. So he's, in the, he, he's a sea creature that lives in the Sea of Isabella, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, and I think he was um, he was one of the characters on the on the boat that rescued um, that rescued Candy. Ah, when right. She was, when she was uh, adrift in the in the Sea of Isabella. Right, right. Yes. Uh, next up is Princess Breath versus Princess Boa. Uh, uh, Princess Boa, of course, is one of the main characters of the Aberrant novels. She's she hasn't showed up yet, but I'm sure that she will. Uh, show up at the end. Princess Breath lives in the nonce. Uh, I think it's 3 p.m. island. And she kind of breathes things into existence and lets the wind take them out to sea. And Princess Boa, we kind of are learning as we go along that she's not as nice of a person as you might 
think that she is, even though she's so revered and, and um, she's royalty, but... Right. And she's like she's like Christopher Carrion's crush, too, right? Yeah, yeah. And she, I think she, that she is cruel to him. Mm-hmm. So in this case, uh, Princess Breath won, and I have a feeling this might have been because uh, her painting, the painting with Princess Breath, is more well-known. Yeah. It shows up on a lot of, like, websites and Pinterest and all these, like, websites that have pictures of Clyde Barker's art. And it is a very striking painting of this redhead woman uh, with a little squid. When, um, when you were when when we were at uh, Clive's studio, was that hanging in the waiting room? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I it took was a picture both, of it. I think both um, both visits for me, it was there. I just I just couldn't remember for sure. I could get them mixed up sometimes. It's very striking. Kind of reminds me a little bit of that books of blood story, the Madonna. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, that pool, that closed down pool, that had those women that were holding these like squid like creatures yeah. and nursing them. So this kind of reminds me of that um, that character. Uh, next up, Finnegan Hobb. I think he's a pirate, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, he, he and he, he's he's sort of a prince uh, born of night and day. I think he, like one parent is from a night island and the other is from a day island. Um, and he was he was supposed to marry Princess Boa, but then she right. was, she was eaten by the dragon or something like that by a dragon that he killed. Yeah. Uh, so he went up against uh, Kaspar Wolfswinkle, kind of a comic relief wizard yeah. <laughs> from the Aberat. Uh So in this case, Finnegan Hobb won, which I'm surprised because I always thought Kaspar Wolfswinkle was a more well-known character. Yeah. And I think his painting was also one of the first paintings that Clive made for the uh, Book of Hours series. Yeah. I have a I have a, a poster of that of that painting oh, that's... hanging up in my TV room. Nice, nice. Next up, Candy Quackenbush versus Christopher Carrion. And uh, a very, very nose-to-nose vote on this yeah. one. Candy Quackenbush took it by one vote. One vote, yeah. yeah. So that was close. He almost, uh, Christopher Carrion almost made it, but he did not. And then after that, we've got Rojo Pixler, uh, the owner of the Pixler Corporation versus Vlitter, which is Vlitter I don't really remember very well, and that may have been the case for a lot of people because Rojo Pixler won. Okay, and he was also the guy who created the mascot of the uh, – what's his name of his corporation? The, oh, the Comexo Corporation, right? He's the, yeah. the Comexo kid. They have the Comexo kid, right? Yeah. He's you like know, it's robot. funny, and this is probably going to be a little obscure for people who will live in America, but uh, – you know, the World Expos, right? I mean, there yeah. was 92, I think it was in Sevilla in Spain or whatever. And then 98, the World Expo was in Lisbon. And there was a mascot. It was this little uh, figure called Gil. Mm. And his head is like, he's like made of water and his head is like a wave. So oh, I, wow. when I saw Aberat after that, when it came out in, in you know, 2002, was it? Yeah. Um, I always thought of the Comexo kid as reminding me of Gil from oh, wow. the Expo 98. Huh. So you can go check out the mascot. Um, that would be an It reminds me of that. For, so every time I see the Barker. Comexo kid, I can only think of Gil from Expo 98. Yeah, wow. It's just a little aside there. Right, right. So Uma Uma Gamagi, one of the goddesses versus Apexamendios. And uh, yeah. I think Apexamendios took the, the battle here. He he honestly he has a better picture you know versus those two. Um, yeah, Richard Kirk. I guess s- score one for the patriarchy. Oh boy, <laughs> that's gonna get some some comments. <laughs> yeah. And then I, next I, up, I, I two voted, brothers. I, I only voted for Uma Uma Gamagi. Oh, me too. Actually, yeah, because yeah, Epic Semendios is kind of a dick. Yeah. <laughs> next up, two brothers. It's, it's, it's called Two Brothers. Yeah. I'm just joking. That was a Rick and Morty reference. Yeah. But Two Brothers, Oscar Godolphin versus Charlie Estabrook. Um, Godolphin won. I think he's a more fun character than Estabrook. I thought Oscar Godolphin was a jerk. Didn't he? He hired uh, Dowd as an assassin, right? Wasn't that Estabrook? I think Godolphin is the guy who wore the Hawaiian shirts and kept jumping into the... Uh, is Orderex to go uh, oh, pedal and uh, yeah, yeah. Right. And meanwhile, he was on the Tabula Rasa and, and hiding that from them. That's right. And but, Charlie but, Estabrook is the guy who hires the, the the murderer to kill Judith. But but and then, but uh, Dowd secretly worked for Go- Oscar Godolphin the whole time. 
Uh, right, right. Yeah. Well, you know, let's not spoil the magica here, but uh, sure. So, yeah. So Godolphin, uh, Godolphin won uh, yeah. with a few more votes. And uh, what's next? We've got Little E's versus Huzzah Aping. So and Huzzah Aping won. Uh, Little E's did not. Yeah, poor little Huzzah. I mean, I'm not going to say what happens to her, but uh, yeah. Little E's is also kind of a weird character. He's like this this uh, brain leech of sorts. Yeah. I think he's, yeah. a, he's some kind of an Oviat, isn't he? Right, he's an Oviat. He's from yeah. the Inovo. Yeah. Well, next up, uh, two two main characters from the Magica again. Autark Sartori versus Quaisoir, his consort and queen. And uh, Quaisoir won. Yeah. Uh, maybe because she has a non-abstract picture. Well, and she also won by one vote. Yeah. Yeah. So it was that was really close. But she be, between the two, I think she's a little more sympathetic. I think so too, because yeah. she's the actually yeah, she's yeah, right. She's much more sympathetic in the in the book. Next up, two reconcilers, uh, Chica Jaquin versus Father Athanasius. Yeah. Uh so two men who have devoted their lives to studying uh Art and magic, and uh, preparing for the reconciliation. Chika Jakin won. Uh, who you know, he's he's a more sympathetic character for me than Father Athanasius, who comes off as more of a zealot. Yeah, yeah. He even you know, he's he doesn't have a very nice story arc, Father Athanasius. But at the end, I think he kind of redeems himself. Yeah. And then we've got two two more main characters, uh, Gentle uh, versus Pi O Pa, and. Uh, this was sort of close, but really Pio Pa won by quite a bit. I mean, I think he had the unfair advantage of having a, a painting by Clive Barker for his portrait. Yes, that is a very well-known painting of Pi, uh, where he's made up to look kind of like the Gioconda in a way, the Mona Lisa. You mm -hmm. know, oh, yeah, that's yeah. kind of the same pose that that mm -hmm. Clive did for Pio Pa. So, uh, congratulations, Pio Pa! And I'm sure that you know, after this, Pio Pa and Gentle just made up. This is not a real battle. They're, they're, you know, they're just going to go into the circle. Yeah. Um, then we have two kind of patriarchal kind of, you know, evil characters. Uh, Kutner Dowd versus the Nulianak. Um, and the Nulianak won, obviously, uh, by a wide margin because he's a much more interesting character in terms yeah. of anatomy and, and purpose. And he doesn't show up that much in the book, but when he does show up – the Nulianaks are kind of made out to be really uh, the stormtroopers of Hepexamendios in a way. Yeah, yeah, and and their their heads look like praying hands. Yeah, and they're like the, they're a collective entity. Like one Nulianak is all Nulianaks. Yeah, it's kind of hard to wrap your hand around, but you know that's yeah. that's, that's what it is. Two Tabula Rasa members next: uh, Giles Bloxham versus Alice Trewith. Tierwit? Uh, uh, Tierwit. Tierwit. There you yeah. go. And, and uh, is, Alice won by, by quite a bit. Is Alice the crazy one? I Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Because there was one that got a stroke or something at the floor of the library and was – I don't know if that was the, the character that, that – uh, Alice, but I think that was, that was her. In the art book bracket, yeah. uh, Fletcher versus Jeff – yeah. Of course, Fletcher won. Yeah, because you know, light the, versus darkness, and he's the good man, Fletcher. Yep, he's the good man, Fletcher. And then we have uh, Kasoon versus Tommy Ray, and uh, Kasoon Kasoon won there. So, so uh, no more Death Boy. Oh well, you know. Yeah, he's not that interesting as a character either. He yeah. he doesn't really. He's rather aimless, I thought. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, the only thing he cares about is his sister. Yeah, he's a, a very unnatural obsession with his sister. Yeah. Which leads us to the next match. Um, Joe Beth McGuire versus Howie Katz. Yeah, and uh, Howie Katz won by a lot, probably because he's probably – he's a little more sympathetic than – Yeah. By, by the end of Everville, Joe Beth is not a super nice, you know, sympathetic character. Sure, sure. So I guess he won here. Um, that then next up two heavy hitters, right? Yeah, yeah. Harry Damore versus Tesla Bombeck. 
Um, Harry's got a lot more uh, Clive Barker history than Tesla, though, and unfortunately, and I think that's what uh, I think that's what what brought him to the to the end of this, and he won by a lot. Yeah, and again, you know, just go listen to our episode about the Great Unknown because that's an awesome script. And uh, we have the Tarata, which are the nightmare entities uh, summoned by the Jeff from the minds of people in L.A. versus the Hallucigenium, which were like the dreamlike entities and the inspiring uh, ghosts. And in this case, Tarata won. And I'm not surprised because that's kind of what happens a little bit in the book, right? <laughs> yeah, right. They're um... – they're more powerful, and they're. I think there are just more of them most of the time. I think that the Jaff was a lot more, um, uh, a lot more successful gathering his army because he was willing, you know, willing to make victims, and and uh, Fletcher didn't want to do that. That's right, and you know, I think when you compare our dreams against our aspirations, it, it, it's hard to to kind of convert them into entities that will duke it out with each other. But I think. Yeah. Dreams are much more uh, – dreams and aspirations are more normal mm -hmm. in a way. They're less aggressive. They're more like um, – they're something that you aspire to be, to have peace, whereas fears are – you know, they, they can come from different areas of your subconscious where they can be things you fear. They can be things that cause you uh, disgust. They can be things that – um, you know, so obviously they affect you in a more visceral way. They're, they're not, they're not going to be things that make you feel at peace. They're going to be things that make you distressed. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that always wins a little over knowing that, you know, it's okay. I'm not, I'm all right. But then when panic hits, it's like nothing is all right. So next up, uh, Raul, the monkey versus Nathan Grillo. Yeah. Uh, two other characters of, uh. The art books. And I think David um, was a little bummed out that uh, he said, oh, man, Nathan Grillo is the keeper of the reef. Yeah, that's right. The, the, the system of computer banks that yeah. kind of catalogs everything. And this is funny because this came just before the Internet got started, right? What, yeah. what year did The Great and Secret Show come out? Well, I mean, before, the world, before the World Wide Web, I guess. Version yeah, of the Internet. yeah, yeah. Well, the, the more widespread version of it, it yeah. started out maybe 93 Something yeah, like that. That's yeah, when that's campuses right. started having internet access and stuff. So uh, in a way, that was kind of like – the reef was kind of like Clive's uh, premonition of the internet in a way. I wonder if that would turn out to be a good website where people could just gather uh, weird clippings yeah. of unexplained phenomena. Yeah. I'm I sure think that, that already exists. It's it called probably. the Fortean Times. Anyway, so that brings us to another couple of heavy hitters, although you wouldn't think so, which are the Yadaroboros versus the Serapushu, the little squids from Quiddity. Yeah. And yeah. the Serapushu won, which kind of makes me feel good. Yeah, the, 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 the good good triumph over evil, at least in this yes. round. Uh, Buddy Vance... <laughs> <laughs> Buddy Vance jogging in his red Adidas uh, tracksuit versus the, the very boring and very uh, angry Homer. Yeah. And I'm not talking about Simpson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Homer. Uh, the, Buddy the, Vance won. The boss at the in the dead letter office in Omaha, Nebraska. I yeah. couldn't imagine being in a more mediocre employment than yeah. being the boss of the dead letter office, yeah. really. <laughs> well, like, what did he do to end up there? Yeah. Uh, but he won by a lot. He had 86% of the votes. That's uh, not surprising. Yeah. But Vance seems like he had a really interesting life. When you see uh, his house in Great and Secret Show and the, the big party thrown mm -hmm. um, to remember him by and all the stuff that is mentioned that is just hanging on his mansion, it seems like he would have had a really interesting life. So next up, uh, Books of Blood Bracket. Yeah, we've got Chachat versus Simon McNeil. And uh, Chachat won. Chachat is a demon, so a demon is always more interesting than a trickster and a fraud, which is what <laughs> Simon McNeil is. Yeah. I guess it depends on what version of Simon McNeil we're also talking about because there's three of them at this point. There's the one 
and the books of blood. There's the one in the movie, the book of blood. Yeah. And there's the one in the animated motion comic, the book of blood. Yeah. And they're all slightly different from each other. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the one in the motion comics is very different. Yeah. Next up, Barbario's Cancer from Son of Celluloid versus The Right Hand from The Body Politic. Yeah. And I was surprised. I thought The Right Hand was going to win. But no, Barbario's Cancer did. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to find a new way to eat your soul. <laughs> yeah. He's he's a very he, he's a very imaginative monster yeah. from The Books of Blood. Uh, I, I rank him up there with... The, the walking cities of uh, Podujevo and Popolac. Mm -hmm. And then it's like Barbario's Cancer and then maybe the Sow from Pig Blood Blues. <laughs> yeah. Those are the monsters I've never seen anything like it before. That's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, uh, after that, we have Jacqueline S. versus Jack Polo. And those, they're very different characters from each other. It's kind of a weird matchup. Um, and Jack Polo is... I kind of felt bad that he lost so badly. He he only had 19% of the votes to Jacqueline S's 81%. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jack Polo is a, is a neat character, and he sort of represents, you know, good tri triumphing over evil. and and uh, Yeah, I think one of the things I took out of the story was that it's not just evil that could be tricky, you know. Yeah. Good can also be tricky. And and that's what Jack Polo does in his Books of Blood story. Yeah. Um, a very low ambition, kind of low energy kind of guy. Uh, his his wife left him for another man. He has two daughters. He's a he he trades in pickles. Yeah, he's a pickle salesman. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and 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 basically he's being haunted by a demon. Yeah. But uh, in this case, yes, Jack Polo lost against Jacqueline S. So. Yeah. Take one for the matriarchy. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Redeemed a little bit. Yes. Uh, the sow. You got to balance these things out, you know. <laughs> yeah. And and the sow in Pig's Blood Blues versus Wybird, the assassin that uh, that killed uh, Simon McNeil. Oh my God! I can't believe the sow won. Yeah, by a lot. <laughs> oink oink. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, Wybird didn't win, uh, uh, which was surprising because he's from a movie. Sometimes when you put, like, uh, movie character pictures here, people tend to go more for those. Yeah. But in this case, I think that they just wanted to be subversive, and they yeah. voted for the Sal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, my, speaking of movie characters now, we've got Mahogany versus Philip Swan. And so this, we talked about this last time. This is a tricky matchup because if we're talking Philip Swan in The Last Illusion, he's just a dead guy. Uh, yeah. But if we're talking Philip Swan in Lord of Illusions, he's a lot more interesting. Yes, he's a much more flawed uh, and alive character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. you can you can see him do stuff, and you know you can see him have use his powers and all that. So yeah, uh, always seems very haunted in the movie, uh, opposed to like you said. In the in the books of blood, because he's just a corpse. And and mahogany yeah. is also a little different in the movie compared to the to the short story as well. Yeah, and this one, Vinnie Jones grabbed Philip Swan by the nuts. Yeah, and twisted it. <laughs> yeah. So mahogany won uh, sixty five percent of the votes. Yeah. Nice, nice victory. Good going, Vinnie Jones. Yeah. Please don't hurt me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Declan from Rawhead Rex versus Aaron, the the little boy from The Skin of the Fathers, and. Aaron won by a lot, and I was surprised here again because we've got a movie character that probably more people would recognize. But then again, the Books of Blood are pretty well known amongst Clive Barker fans. So I think that uh, if they realize, oh, that's Aaron from the Skin of the Fathers, you know, then they could say, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that I love that story. Nobody wanted to vote for Declan because he stinks of piss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Declan from Rawhead Rex did not win, and yeah. uh, I was surprised because Aaron, I think, is an underrated character. I yeah. mean, uh, you know, not many people but would remember him from the Books of Blood, I, I imagine, because there's a lot more interesting monsters there. Mm -hmm. But he won. And uh, next up is Jerome from Age of Desire versus the Madonna from, you the know, Madonna. the story with the same yeah. name. Yeah. And uh, in this case, the Madonna won with 77% of the votes. So yeah. an 
Chalk another one for the females in this uh, bracket. Yeah. And then after that, we've got uh, Quaid from Dread versus Gregorius from Down Satan. And, and uh, Quaid got 82% of the votes. I think Dread is a, you know, Down Satan is a neat story, but it's very short. Uh, and Dread is a much more well known um, Clive Barker story. Yeah, it spawned a movie and a comic book adaptation, so. Yeah. And Quaid is a, a fascinating, another fascinating haunted character. Um, looks like a Dutch sh- dope pusher. I think yeah. that's the description in the story. And the, that comic picture of him really does look like a Dutch dope pusher. Yeah, I have actually a, a painted page of this story. Oh, um, really? Yeah, it was painted by Daniel uh, Brereton, mm-hmm. who did the Nocturnals and stuff like that. And he painted the story for Eclipse for the Eclipse graphic novel, and I have a page of it where he's telling um, he's telling his friend uh, that he has a book that he needs to give him. I'm just going to go there and get it, and that's right before he comes up behind the the guy and, and uses the chloroform on him. Oh. So yeah, there's some good good uh, good good uh, panels there with uh, Quaid on, on that piece of art that I own. So that's. One of my favorite renditions. I didn't like the one in the movie. It just, uh, yeah, I, I don't like I the movie. I didn't either, yeah. Yeah. I think this is perfect. The perfect description of Quaid from the story was literally translated to the canvas, and it, it looks so much better. Yeah. Gregorius, on the other hand, is another guy who also wanted to touch the beast, right? And, and Gregorius, I, he, yes, right. Uh, and and uh, he, he had... Uh, he was sort of an interesting uh, commentary, commentary, I guess, on religion. You know that he 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 wanted to uh, he wanted to he was so religious that he obsessed over hell. Yeah, he thought that if his soul was in mortal danger, if he wanted to get really close to the devil, that maybe God would intervene, and so in that sense, he would be touched by God to, or mm-hmm. saved by God from the devil. But it turns out that he just. Of course, you know, when whenever someone goes into this spiral, they just fall into the spiral of hell, and he ended up becoming – creating a hell on earth. So, uh, yeah. And I like the, the thing that they did in the Eclipse graphic novel comic book adaptation mm-hmm. because if you look at that, it's not – a literal adaptation of the comic book story. There is these bookends that they created for it where they're interrogating this guy and the, the secretary, and he's telling them the story. And then at the end, there's like these – what I imagine to be like Vatican assassins in a way mm. that that take care of him after he tells his story. Do you remember that, the, the Eclipse no. graphic novel? Yeah, I, I mean I, I'm sure that I read it, but it was probably back in the 90s. Right, right. So yeah, there's the – the adaptation is one guy telling Gregorius' story to a bunch of guys in that mm. dark room, and he's being interrogated. And then at the end, they said, all right, we got the story. Thank you. They just pull out a gun and shoot him. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So that's not how the story goes in, in the Book of Blood. Uh, right. There's no um, – There's just a, there's a, a, a narrator. A, yeah. There was kind of, kind of a narrator, but it's just, you know, like a, a – and, and, A typical third-person omniscient yes. narrator that you always get. Yeah. So fascinating character, Gregorius. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so that was the results of Duels of Blood round one. So yeah. how are we going to do this now with the winners? So, how are you going to pair them? Yeah, so round two, I'll just run through these really quickly. We'll have Diamanda versus John Mischief. Okay. Uh, Mendelssohn Shape versus Dodo. Mm-hmm. Princess Breath versus Finnegan Hobb. Uh, Candy Quakenbush versus Rojo Pixler. And then uh, we'll have Hepexamendios versus Oscar Godolphin. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> sorry, sorry, Oscar. Uh, yeah. uh, Huzzah Aping versus Quasar. Uh, mm, interesting. Chica Joaquin versus Pai Pa. Sorry, Chica Joaquin. I don't think. I that's don't know. Be tough. Yeah. Uh, and the Nolian Act versus Alice Tierwit. Again, you know. <laughs> Sorry, Alex Tierwood. Yeah, you think the Nolian Act's going to take it. Yeah. And then we're going to have the Fletcher versus Kassoon. Yeah. Uh, awesome matchup there. Uh, yeah. Holly Katz versus Harry Damour. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Tarata versus Raul. Uh, sorry, yeah. Raul. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know how that's going to go. I the Zerapushu is going to go up against Buddy Vance. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they'll build him a new body. Yeah. Bring him back from the dead. Yeah. 
Um, in the Books of Blood bracket, we'll have Chachat versus Barbario's Cancer. Gosh, I love that matchup. That's going to be great. <laughs> Jacqueline S. versus The Sow. Uh-huh. Um, Mahogany versus Aaron. And The Madonna versus Qu- uh, Quaid. Quaid, yeah. yeah. Interesting, the Mahogany versus Aaron I'm not sure who I would vote for, to be honest. Yeah, that's, a, both, that's a tough one. They're both good characters, and I, I really like the way they adapted the comic book story. I think the artwork was done by Klaus Jansen, mm. I think. So, yeah, very, very interesting matchups here. Some of them kind of match up some scenes in the books, especially in the art uh, trilogy. Yeah. Bracket, you're going to have Howie Katz and Harry Damore, and you're going to have you know, Fletcher versus Kassoon. Uh, interesting. Interesting to see what's, what's going to come out of this. Well, and as you're listening to this, when this episode is posted, this, this uh, new, next round should be available. Uh, so okay. voting should have, will have started already. So, you know, go over to duelsofblood.com and start voting again in round two, and that'll be in for another two weeks. Okay, excellent. So it's probably going to start on the 7th or 8th? Of April? Uh, yeah, the, it'll be the um, Sunday. Ninth. It'll be Sunday, the, Sunday ninth. Okay. The ninth. Yeah, early in the morning. Well, Alaska time anyway. And probably going to end on April twenty third or something like that. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So keep get voting, get cracking, because there's a another five rounds to go. <laughs> yeah. So so that brings us over to Clive Barker's eight through Z of horror. Mm-hmm. Um. And this this time we're covering letters D, E, and F okay. um, from from the book and from the the TV show. So D was for Devil Rides Out, and I have to admit that I had never seen this movie, so that made me kind of uh, that made me look look for it on the internet, and I I, I went and watched it. All right. Well, I, I didn't watch it, so I I think I've watched it a long time ago, and I yeah. remember a few things of it. So what did you think of it? I thought of um, I thought that that it was kind of cool. I mean, I think that the characters are kind of stuck up snobs, and they're they're always like ordering their servants around. And and the, there was there was one point in, in the, this this whole chapter was about Dennis Wheatley and his style of writing and his books and everything. But there was one point where one of the characters says like, "May I borrow your car?" And he says, "Yes, take any of them." And it's just <laughs> this kind of it was just this kind of like you know. I don't this kind of like snobbery, you know, where the the rich people Posh. are the, Yeah, the rich people are the ones who can solve all the, you know, all the world's problems and Right. Well, you're talking about a movie that has people who are like royalty, right? Like yeah. nobles. Um, yeah. in a way like a duke or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um but so Christopher Lee, I love I love watching him and his voice is awesome. And again, this was written by Richard Matheson, the script, uh, although it was based on a story by, like you said, uh, Dennis uh, Wheatley. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, pretty cool. I, I remember a little bit of it. I know there's a lot of occultist stuff there. And, you yeah. know, it, <laughs> Christopher <laughs> Lee is a Duke, Duke the Rich, Rich, Richelieu or something. Yeah. They, they, yeah. They, they, every, anytime a demon or, or the devil would show up, they would just throw a crucifix at it. <laughs> that happens a lot in Dracula movies. Yeah. So uh, Clive says that, um, cla- you know, the, the book says the classic British horror has an unwritten rule. Aristocrats should suffer mightily against the forces of darkness, but it's always the servants who should mop up the blood. I like this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. I like this line a lot. So apparently this guy was a really prolific author, Dennis Wheatley. I mean, yeah. I, honestly, I'd never read any of his stuff, but it Me seems either. like he traded more in the sort of like um, – uh, what in America would probably be called a little pulp. Yeah, and, and I think that he he was probably going out of style by the time you and I were born. So, right. Yeah, he his his novels were really more like late sixties and early seventies, I think. And like any good uh, British writer of of you know occult books and 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 more like exploitation kind of books, he must have had a really interesting life. It says here that. It is said that during one 48-hour period, Wheatley smoked 250 cigarettes, drank five magnums of champagne, and still managed to write 20,000 words. Mm. So what the hell, Clive? 
Where are my 20,000 words? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Uh, but yeah, it seems like this guy had a really like a lavish lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was, uh, he was, he, he was really pro prolific and, and, um, popular author and he sold a lot of, a lot of books and was rich. Yeah. Uh, Uncharted Seas, To the Devil, A Daughter, and some of these turned into movies. Yeah. Um, most of them for Hammer, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, I, I like the, I like the sort of over-the-top style and, and um, there, there was another funny part in the movie where uh, they had snuck into this house and they had disrupted this ritual and they, they, they snuck into the house later and they, these, these two chickens were still left in a basket in the closet and Christopher Lee says, well, at least we saved your lives. And then he <laughs> shut the basket and closed the closet door and they left the house. <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> no, you didn't. They're still in there. They're still stuck in there. Yeah. Well, the, the thing about uh, Dennis Wheatley that they bring in this chapter is that he wrote these books that were kind of a little exploitation books about the occult. But in his private life, he actually – was really into occultist stuff and uh he knew a lot about actual literature from the occult and it says here the paradoxical thing about wheatley was that privately he was a considerable expert on the occult and supernatural fiction whereas his novels were considered misrepresentative and cheaply sensational yeah. by many people with an interest in the subject matter and, well, probably uh, people didn't like that, you know, that, that the occultists were all, you know, evil bad guys trying to try with to, robes and yeah. knives, trying to the murder virgins in a basement in London. Yeah. But so it goes on to conclude in this chapter that uh, today most of his volumes have disappeared from publisher back backlists and bookstores. His work has been eclipsed by a more visceral approach to horror, and his fiction now appears somewhat dated containing sexist and parochial imagery that would be unacceptable to most modern readers of the genre. Yeah. This sometimes happens, right? I mean, there, there's been a lot of, like, writers who were really very popular when, you know, decades ago. But then it seems like society changes, moves on a little bit, and, and then everything becomes very, very dated. Yeah. And, and, and they kind of fall out of, of, of the radar for another generation. Uh, which I guess it comes with like the different cultural backgrounds of each generation. I mean, you know, some people like to read what their parents read. Some people like to read different stuff. Yeah. But I think most people like to move on to something that's more contemporary. Um, I, I've always had a lot of like eclectic uh, choices to read from because I had a library that belonged to my great grandfather. And oh, wow. I found out about a lot of authors that most people probably don't even know existed. And some of them were pretty big. I mean, there were – some of them were like uh, – there was a particular uh, – I think he was Austrian or German. There was a writer called Stefan Zweig. He was Jewish. And I think he was at one point one of the most translated writers and, and uh, romance uh, writers in the world. Um, but nowadays, nobody remembers him. I mean, there's a few movies made recently of some of his books and stories. But I don't think people really – uh, he sold millions and millions of books back in the 20s, and nowadays, you know, you can find maybe one or two out there, but they're really hard to find. So that's something that comes with different generations, you know. They just they just obsess or they just make other things popular according to what's what's the, the trend going on. Um, so it's, it's interesting that uh, a guy like Dennis Wheatley, who says here at some point – he sold millions and millions of copies of his books worldwide, and he was translated to, like, I don't know how many languages. Yeah. And nowadays, it's probably very hard to find, except yeah. maybe some of his most well-known novels. Well, and this was, like, 97 when this when the Clive Barker's A to Z of Horror came out. You know, and even, even back then, they were like, yeah, he's kind of fading away into obscurity. Yeah. And uh, Christopher Lee has something to say about Weedley. He says... In a way, it's a very good thing that he's not alive to see what happened today. In my opinion, the virtual breakdown of discipline in this country and many others. Kind of a conservative thing to say from Christopher yeah. Lee, though. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, he was part of, you know, a lot of movies that some may consider exploitation in a way. Yeah. Uh, so he wasn't exactly, like, involved with high art throughout all his career. And I don't mean to say that in a depreciative way towards Christopher Lee because I know a lot of people – 
love him and he's a great actor and he was like Saruman mm. in Lord of the Rings and all that so Count Dooku Count Dooku oh my god that's the horrible that's the most horrible name for uh, a Star Wars character ever <laughs> what? Count Dooku I, right I mean doesn't it sound slightly rude oh I don't know I had Count Dooku <laughs> I hadn't thought of it that way I think that the one of the other stupid names from Star Wars movies is like uh, uh, that that guy uh, who's like a robot. His name is Grievous, General Grievous. Oh, I like General Grievous. Oh, you do? But yeah. it's like the name is just like what? It's what's what's the other villain going to be called? Also, like villain, you know, bad face, feel bad. <laughs> okay. like, you know what I'm saying? Because Grievous is like, you know, it's not a name. It's it's. Anyway, whatever. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah. So E for Escape, right? Yeah. Yes. E, e for Escape is really just all about uh, John Carpenter and Deborah Hill and Halloween. Yeah, Halloween uh, launched the whole genre, you know, slasher films. And th- and this is one of the uh, this is one of them where I think it might be better to watch the TV um, episode than reading the book. I mean, I'd recommend doing both, but for this particular chapter. There's a section where John Carpenter talks about what kind of camera angle he uses and the effect that it has. And on the TV show, they 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 show, they, they show exactly what he's talking about with him narrating that, you know, and and versus you know just reading it in a in a on a page. So and so that's since cool. the episode uh, since the episodes mix all the words together instead of going alphabetically, the E for Escape in the TV show is on episode four. Yeah, yeah, and actually we probably should have mentioned that here at the start. Um, episode 5 has D for Devil Rides Out, Episode 4 has E for Escape, and Episode 6 has F, but it's a different F than, than, the, than what's in the book. So, But we'll get to that part. Um, yeah, and it's kind of too bad Rob's not here because he loves talking about Halloween. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, he sent me a copy, a Blu-ray copy of Halloween Six: uh, The Curse of Michael Myers. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. He sent me one of those copies once. Uh, I think it was either for my birthday or for Christmas or something. I, I've seen one through three for sure, and I think there was one after that that I saw at a friend's house where like Michael Myers got blown up with dynamite or something, and some guy was like nursing him back to health. <laughs> in like a shack or something and then of course he killed him after he woke up I've seen all of them I think it's like 10 movies I've yeah. seen all of them and I, I've seen I, the Rob Zombie ones I saw the first one I didn't see the second one oh okay but yeah Halloween to me like the good ones it's mm-hmm. kind of like Hellraiser in a way I think it's just one, one, two, and 4 yeah um because those are the one. I mean, the third one from Halloween is Season of the Witch, which has very little to do with the Michael Myers stuff. Yeah, yeah, it has nothing to do with it. But it, but, um, but it has really good John Carpenter music in it. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And everybody has those like uh, Shamrock masks. Yeah. Right. The company was called Shamrock. <laughs> wow. Silver Shamrock. So, it was a three hundred twenty thousand dollar movie uh, when. Carpenter made it, and uh, it turned out to make over fifty million over right, the years. Yeah. Didn't it break some kind of a record for the percentage of profit that it made? Uh, yeah, quite probably. Yeah, very, very likely. Uh, let me just type it up on uh, Box Office Mojo and see what comes up because this fifty million is from nineteen ninety seven. Let's see on Box Office Mojo. Here it is: Halloween, first one. Oh, okay. So uh, here it is. Uh, total lifetime grosses domestic $47 million. And foreign is not available on Box Office Mojo. So, yes, it's uh, production budget $325,000. Uh, that was 1978. Mm-hmm. And this is what got a lot of like producers like raising their eyebrows going like, hey, wait we a minute. Should, we need to make one of those. We need to make more of these. Yeah. And, you know, that's why you got – a bunch of like slasher films throughout the eighties and stuff. Yeah. It's because of this. And there's a really awesome uh, podcast and I, I probably shouldn't be talking about other podcasts in our podcast, but yeah, if you listen, if, <laughs> if you listen to the Brett Easton Ellis podcast, he made an episode talking to uh, Carpenter 
So go listen wow. to it because he talks about his experience making the movies and all that and and making music um, with his son, which I'm sure some of you out there may have seen, like the live performances that he's done recently. Um, so, yeah, go check that one out. That's, that's, a, that's awesome. a really good one. Yeah. So – that was uh, so. How that was Halloween. I think he had talked about. I think one major theme that he had talked about was that uh, previous horror movies had been set in some like haunted house out in the middle of nowhere, and he wanted to say, you know, look, you think you're safe in your suburbs or whatever, you know, where all the houses look the same and they're all close together. Uh, he wanted to set a horror movie there where people think that feel like they're safe and and you know your home is supposed to be your sanctuary and and you know what if. What if this evil monster character is, you know, supernatural stalker character is breaking into people's houses and killing babysitters? Yeah, yeah. It was originally going to be uh, called the Babysitter Murders or something like that, uh, I think. But you're right. The movies, horror movies by that time were always like either they were like a Victorian setting where it's like a big castle where Dracula lives or uh, – Frankenstein's estate or yeah, or Amityville is like a house out in the middle of nowhere, right? Right, right. So uh, it's always very secluded or very old or, you know, and when you look at the suburbs in America, which is kind of kind of an American thing. I mean, the way you guys build cities. I come from a country where cities have a medieval, uh, you know, map yeah. to them. Yeah. It's like we're from cities that used to have a wall around them. And then, you know, you're walking through downtown whatever and it's it's like a winding little labyrinth of roads uh, right like one 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 lane roads that are like yeah paved and stu- with with uh, bricks and stuff and then you come to america or any other country like germany who's you know who rebuild most of their cities and then you see that you know everything's squared out it's easy to navigate you know okay it's like you know a street and second or whatever. So that's easy yeah. to know where you're going to, you don't have to memorize the name of some explorer from the last century and say, <laughs> you have to go to, you know, the marquee something, you know, street meets the corner of, uh, you know, mm. whatever, whatever name. Uh, so it's much easier to just have numbers and letters, although it's not as, it's not as cool, right? It's yeah. not as, as interesting as, as having streets that have, names of like personalities but for example uh here in arizona where i'm living everything is so wide and so squared out it's very very nice and pleasant but you never think that this would be the place where something like ed gein would would do something you know yeah even though nowadays you turn on the news and you find out that oh uh some person killed their entire family um in this neighborhood, and everybody's like, oh, he was a very quiet man, yeah. very quiet man, never had any problems with him. And yet, in, in like some suburban little house, you know, some atrocity can happen there. And it's people realize, oh, this these places, even though it may be a gated community or it may be like a little place with manicured lawns where everybody knows everybody. And, and oh, hi, Bob. Hi, Joe. That's at in the corner house, there may be something going on that it's horrible. And then yeah. they go and they're like, oh, they dug up some bodies out of the backyard or something. So I think that was a wake-up call for a lot of people. They were like, oh, wow. So these things can happen even in my you know, suburb. Yeah. Uh, it's cool because the way that Carpenter made the movie, you have – sometimes he switches the point of view where it's like Laurie – thinks he's being watched and then she looks and then the camera goes to this middle of this bush where like Michael Myers is there. And, and then you can sometimes see through the little mask holes. Like yeah. the, the camera's looking through the mask. And then it, it, it at other times it just the camera sees like a shape there behind a bush and then cuts back to Lori, then cuts back to the bush and it's not there anymore. Yeah. So that that kind of that kind of creates this tension in the the movie, and I, I think that's very, very uh, – that's one of the reasons why Halloween works so well. So, yeah, there's a lot to, to see, so you, you should go check out this, like Ryan said, on the episode of the TV show. Fourth episode, I think? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. I think it's yeah. episode – yeah, episode four, E for mm-hmm. Escape. 
It also has J, I, and K for whatever reason. They're, they're, so, they're organized so weird. Wasn't uh, wasn't there like a special TV special um, horror, horror cafe horror or something where uh, Clyde Barker was along with uh, Roger Corman and Carpenter and a few other authors yeah. trying to come up with an uh, idea? Yeah, and like I think Wes Craven too, right? Wes Craven, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's okay. That was pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So F F is for flesh. Yeah. Which uh, is about H.R. Giger and and uh, primarily about his design for Alien and his uh, and his involvement with studio movie studio projects, but it also goes into some other detail about his life. Yeah, Giger, unfortunately, no longer with us. Um, yeah. I was trying to find the post that Clyde Barker did on Facebook where he was talking about it after Giger passed away, but unfortunately. If I can find it, I'll add it to the show notes. But unfortunately, it's really hard to find stuff on Facebook, especially yeah. if it's go, it goes back a few months or maybe a year. Forget it. It's really hard to search for it. So, um, But if I can find it, I'll add it to the show notes because I think I remember Clive made a very heartfelt uh, and beautiful um, statement about Giger. And uh, if you go to Revelations, you'll find some pictures of Clive on the studio when Giger visited him. Um, and uh, some early Aberrat paintings, I think. So, yes, I mean, he's one of my favorite artists. What can yeah. I say? I mean, ever since the early 90s, I got into Giger because I bought one of his art books in Canada when I was visiting in 93. Which one, Necronomicon? No, it was just called The Art of H.R. Giger, oh, okay. and it was for Toshin books. Hmm. Um, and... Um, and then I, I, you know, then obviously I, I got into Clyde Barker as well. And then I saw that Clyde Barker had written a introduction for his book, The Necronomicon, I think. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I got into H.R. Giger when I was in high school also. Actually, a friend of mine, I was really into Alien, and a friend of mine was, you know, he had a job and he just spent all of his money on stuff, you know, when he would, because he was in high school too. And, so he bought two copies of every single Giger art book, which they were like 80 bucks a piece. And he wow. would take one copy of the book and cut out the pictures that he liked to frame and put on his wall. And then he would give me these cut up books. And so I took the cut up books and I cut out every picture and I just made like wallpaper for my room. That's and so it was cool. just all H.R. Giger stuff in my room, which freaked some people out. But. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, uh, this book here, the A, A to Z of Horror, has some quotes from uh, people like Harlan Ellison, where he uh, he kind of expounds on what you're just saying, like that unpleasantness of his artwork. Mm -hmm. And Harlan Ellison says, and I quote: "He isn't trying to quell our jangled sensibilities, nor is he trying to lull us with restatements of the naturalistic status quo. For Pete's sake, just look at what he shows us. Look at the econ iconographic choices he makes." He gives us elements of the shark, the spider, the scorpion, insect worms, crocodiles, teeth, crushing limbs, ichor, slick coils, wounds, razors, surfaces across and down which we'd slide, unable to get a handhold, bottomless depths, malevolent eyes, the death rictus, and the sybaritic leer. This man knows what we fear, and he shows it to us again and again. Don't bother me with this terrible beauty nonsense. That's for parvenus, for diddlers. Giger is working with primal materials, and his mission is to stand our hair on end, to unnerve us. And I, I think that's a perfect description of some of his artwork. Um, and and there, was a, there was a lot of uh, interview with H.R. Uh, Giger in this, in this chapter, too, which was really nice. And he, mm -hmm. had, he, had said, um, he had said that he, uh, he started out by painting the things that were in his dreams... And he had these terrible nightmares, and when he would paint them, it would sort of exercise them, and they it would make things better. Yeah, which is true for a lot of uh, of us. I mean, that's the one way we can work out our fears and uh, you know our anxieties is to put them on paper, right? I mean, yeah. Once you put it on paper, you gain control over it because you are you are summoning it and bending it to your will in a way. Yeah. It's kind um, of a shame that the uh, TV series had F was for something else because it would have been nice to see these videos, you know, these interviews with H.R. Giger, you know, actually in video. 
Absolutely. I, I'm lucky enough to have bought some documentaries uh, of H.R. Giger. I have a signed mm. DVD of a documentary uh, about H.R. Giger, which might have been one of the last documentaries that he did. And uh, so I'm, I'm very lucky to have one signed by Giger. Um, I made one in high school. Really? Cool. <laughs> I got a D. It was oh, no. Our visual communications class, we were supposed to do a five-minute uh, video presentation about something. Uh-huh. And mine was 30 minutes about H.R. Giger. And it was like, I had I had these this, these musical cues, like the soundtrack from Alien and stuff. And, and I timed all these paintings to these musical cues. So they, these paintings would be sitting on the screen for a long time. And then... Then I would say something at the right musical cue or whatever, and then go on to the next painting. And so it would just sit on these things forever, and it oh was a half gosh, an you hour still have long. That? Uh, I think I do. Yeah, I could probably find it. Put it on Vimeo. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I will. Yeah. If I can, if I find it, I'll do that. But um, yeah, he told me I got a D, and he told me my grade was going to look like a turd in a punch bowl. Jesus Christ! <laughs> yeah. Fucking teachers sometimes. <laughs> People with little imagination. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I had thought, like, oh, this is going to be so cool that he won't care how long it is. But that was not the case. Mm. Okay. I don't, think, well, that he, I don't think that he thought it was cool either. Yeah. But, but the nice thing is that the, the whole classroom was full of Amigas. Um, that's, what the, the, that's what the editing was done on. Oh, wow. Yeah. Edited on an Amiga. Yeah, yeah, so I could actually work on this at home also since I had an Amiga. Some of these interviews with Giger, he talks about some of the uh, projects that he did over the years that some of them never really happened. And I think yeah. most of the ones he's talking about never really happened. I was really surprised to find out. I mean, I knew about Jodorowsky's Dune, but I was really surprised to find out that right after that, there was also a Ridley Scott Dune that didn't happen. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know a lot about that. I know more about the Jodorowsky Dune because yeah. there's a documentary called Jodorowsky's Dune. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I, I didn't know about that. I think that after really Scott gave up on that, that's when he made Blade Runner, I think. Yeah, and I think that uh, Giger's art was going to be featured in both versions, both of those versions of Dune, because it probably just would have carried over. You know, onto so the- you're, you're the guy, you're like the authority on Japanese stuff. Uh, so what is this Tokyo, the last megalopolis? Have you ever heard of this? No, I, 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 I'm not that big of an authority, but I... I I wrote that down because I wanted to look it up. Okay. I, and I, um, plan, I actually, uh, Robert and I planned, when we were living in Japan, planned on going down to Tokyo to visit H.R. Giger's bar. Mm-hmm. But because of the the, um, the earthquake in, in um, Kobe, the train stations and train tracks were all messed up, and we just couldn't couldn't get there, and Robert went back to went back to the United States, and so he kind of left me there for the rest of the ah, I see, I see. Uh, yeah, doing some research for this, I did find some stuff about Dead Star, uh, which was going to be a sci-fi movie that he mm-hmm. had made some work for, but that never really got made. And I think I remember reading about this not too long ago. I was going through some old magazines. It might have been either a Cine Fantastique or a Fangoria. I remember seeing some images of it, like some stills of the the monsters and some uh, stills from photography that they were doing for this movie. But it turns out that the movie never got made, I think. Uh, it's called Dead Star. Yeah. It was going to be done with director Bill Malone. He was also making another movie called Mirror uh, that was supposed to have some H.R. Giger art. Unfortunately, you know, like I said, it, it, they never really got made. And I think it, it's really, it really sucks because when you look at, for example, the work that Giger did for uh, Jodorowsky's Dune, yeah. And he had made those – everybody knows those Harkonnen chairs that he made Yeah, that look like they're made out of bones, but they're made out of metal. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they cost like $10,000 each, and you have to order them like a few weeks, give them a few weeks to make one. They're still making them, I think. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, it's called the Harkonnen Capo chair. And all those things were going to be in that Jodorowsky's Dune, but it never got made. So, yeah. you know, th- there was even like this giant tank – that was going to be a Harkonnen tank. And it, it didn't show up on Dune, but it did show up, I believe, in a Japanese Sony ad uh, on TV. And yeah. I, I don't know if I can dig that up, but it might be on YouTube. 
look up like Sony ads with Giger artwork. You may be able to find it. There was a lot of really awesome stuff. And I mean, the movie itself was a, just, you know, sort of above average, I guess. But uh, um, Species had a lot of really cool Giger stuff. Like there was one section that was a, she was sleeping on a train and there was a dream of a, a Giger designed train with a skull on the front of it. It was yeah. really neat. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Absolutely, that's that's one of his paintings. I've seen that painting. And, and um, I think that he, I think that he regretted a lot of the work that he did on movies, just because they did they never quite turned out the way he was hoping. <laughs> yeah, he says he says in the interview that sometimes I ask myself why they used me on this film instead of someone else because there are so many excellent film designers. I become so excited about a project that I lose my ability to make good business decisions, and I give far more than I paid for. Yeah, uh, than I am paid for. So yeah, even there's like a guy here talking about producing a film, and he says I felt bad because I think a Giger put put in a lot more hours into this than we wanted him to, and yeah, and we, they ended up not using it. I think. Yeah, that's a shame. And- it is a shame. There was one uh, one exception in here that they didn't, or one thing they didn't mention. Um, have you heard of a movie called Future Kill? Yeah, I saw the poster was made by Giger. Yeah, yeah, and there is there is a character that looks like that poster with the the crossbow that's stuck on his hand and the like the half mask or whatever. Yeah, is that a German movie or something? Uh, I don't know. I, I maybe it is. I think if I saw it, I probably saw it dubbed. But it's I a, saw it's a really a, a, terrible low budget, you know, sort right. of punk sci-fi punk. I uh, saw a trailer for that, I think. Yeah. But I also saw a movie that Giger was involved with. It was called Killer Condom. Oh jeez. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> it's about these condoms that uh that have teeth and bite off men's penises. And the, he designed the the Killer Condom. Uh, it was <laughs> okay. H.R. Giger. Okay. There, yeah, there's a lot of pictures of the killer yeah. condom. Uh, so go 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 check that out. I guess yeah. if you're in the mood for like a really cheesy, cheesy crazy movie. Um, well, that was one thing that uh, that one interesting thing I guess that kind of relates to something that Giger said in this in this book too was that um, he felt that the the biggest threats to you know or the biggest things that we're we're all obsessed with and that that are the biggest threats to us are are sex and overpopulation i think there was something else too but but yeah and so that that sort of was reflected in his work where you'd have a a field of of babies you know yeah yeah that's that's a a well-known picture of his yeah yeah uh well you know again you know he says the, the landscape of horror is the body it's diseases, decay, and secretions. It's a world that Giger explores with the insight of the other great artists of the horrific, such as Goya and Bacon. Like them, he creates strange places in which eventually we find a home. And I think the, the, the thing that calls to me from Giger's art is that it looks like art that's painted from the subconscious, you know, that the, these weird things that it's not a world we want to live in, but it's it's definitely a world that seems like – you walk past the the mirror and you're in a different place where everything is dark and and greasy and and decaying and it, it's hard to explain but it, it it feels familiar somehow it feels like a place that we know it but we suppress it mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying yeah but then he just puts it on our face and i guess that's that's one of the reasons why we feel attracted and both repulsed and attracted by it yeah yeah, he sort of mixes sort of beautiful and grotesque things in the same paintings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, of course, he was also very involved with Alien, but I guess, you know, that everybody knows that. Yeah, well, and actually there was um, – he had a choice, I think, around in, like, 1985, 1986. He had a choice between Poltergeist 2 and Aliens, and he always has regretted that he cho- he went with Poltergeist two instead of Aliens. He, you know, obviously Aliens went on to be a big hit and uh, a really good movie. And Poltergeist two, people don't really remember that much. One of the weird things he mentions here is that when he made the sculpture for Alien, because he made the sculpture for the monster and the eggs, yeah, uh, he didn't let anybody else do it. But he wanted it to be, and this is this is kind of a thing that he does. He has a book called Biomechanoid. And he has all these biomechanoid um, designs. Yeah. And and 
he made Alien with all sorts of weird things coming out of it, including wires. Although, of course, for the yeah. movie, I think they kind of pared those down. They kind of made the character a little more sleek and organic. But, uh, but you know, his original idea was that it was a monster that was kind of a mixture between mm -hmm. organic elements and technological elements or mechanical. Yeah. And I guess you kind of see that a little bit because the way that the monster moves and when you look at, like, insects and, 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 and things like that, they kind of feel a little mechanic, don't they? Uh, yeah. Sometimes, it, yeah, like spiders and stuff. Um, it feels like it could be something that someone built. In fact, there is like a little robot that's for sale now that's like a mechanical spider. I saw it the other day. It's fascinating. Um, you can actually like control it with your phone, and there's an app to it. It's, it's crazy. But anyway, my point was that uh, interesting that the alien was supposed to be a mixture between organic elements and mechanical elements. Um well, kind of makes it look more like a, an angry-looking ant on steroids. Well, and the, the, the concept artists for Aliens, actually, they copied Giger's design, but they put even bigger, like, more pronounced wires and stuff on it. Yeah, I think the original design, I'm not sure, but I think that you remember in Aliens 2, they have these kind of, like, weird bony structures coming out of their backs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like these these tubes or something, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think that was in the original one. Um, it it maybe is, but they're not uh, they're not as, as pronounced. Yeah, yeah, and like there the, the like, face is different. It, on aliens, there were these huge like ribbed tubes coming around the side of the alien's face that weren't like they weren't like that in in Alien. Yeah, and the original figurines of Alien, the first movie, you can kind of see through. The, the 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 shiny surface of the head and you can see kind of like elements of a skull behind yeah, it yeah yeah and then they kind of did away with that and just turned into shiny black head yeah so yeah i guess you know things evolve and i i think they did a good job with giger's design on alien one and two um so that's you know and, uh, and clive barker has said when he was talking about alien versus aliens he has said that he thought that the original alien was the sort of invincible tank um, you know, versus like in Aliens, they could kill them with guns. And he said, if you took the alien from the first movie and put it in Aliens, then nobody would be able to stop it. Yeah, uh, right. I mean, that the, the feels like the second one. I never thought about that, but that's a great point. It, it kind of takes away the fear of the alien. Yeah. Because he's more vulnerable in the second movie, but there's more of them. It's not just one. So there's a bunch of them. Yeah. So it's like it's like having a just one zombie chasing you slowly, and it's like, all right, I can manage this. Yeah. Opposed to being surrounded by zombies, you know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I always thought that going back to having just one alien, like they did on the third one, is the is the good way for the movie formula to go with with the alien monster. I I liked Alien Three, and it got a lot of crap um, at the time. I mean, I think killing off Ripley, I guess, was something that people didn't – and Newt, people really didn't like uh, like that. Hmm. I just don't like it when she screams. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. It was pretty high-pitched. Yeah, that movie went through a production hell, right? I mean, yeah. it was one of those movies that had to be restored from uh, uh, VHS footage and stuff. To make the director's cut. Yeah, and I, I even remember seeing um, the trailer in the theater that said, "On Earth, everyone can hear you scream." And so they oh. got they got far enough along that they were actually advertising the wrong movie. Hmm. Interesting. So it was going to take place on Earth. Yeah, yeah. There was there were so many different versions of Alien Three. There was one that was going to be on Earth. Wow. So yeah, Giger. That's the F for flesh. Um, and, long live the new flesh. And and just to, just to kind of quickly go, uh, you know, quickly go over that, on the TV series, F is for Final Frame, which was in the 1800s, you know, if somebody died and they maybe never got a picture with that person, you know, like a kid or a spouse or whatever, they would pose their corpse and take a photograph with them. That's nuts, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Life was so different just, uh, you know, 200 years ago. Or, or less. Yeah, there was uh, art photography, death photography, that's what it was called. Um, 
they would just dress them up, prop them up in a chair, and uh, get a picture taken. Sometimes with family relatives around the body, you know, they'd be like, "Hey, here's me with my uncle." Huh? When after he passed away, that's just nuts. And before they did photos of it, they did paintings. Uh, my brother has a painting, hmm. which may be from the 1800s, uh, that he bought from like a, a, a warehouse sale, and it's it's an old painting of a, a, a gentleman uh, dressed in a suit. He's just sitting in a chair, and you can tell he's dead because his eyes are closed, and he's just, you know, it's a corpse. Wow. And, and they would do that. And not just that. Sometimes they would do face masks of them, you know, especially if they were famous. They would do what's called a death mask, which is they would put some plaster on the dead guy's face and take a, a, a mold of it. And then they would put his face on a museum or whatever. And wow. And for writers, they did that with their right hand, their writing hand oh. sometimes. Huh. Yeah, they would also do a plaster mold of their hand, which is uh, another way that, you know, humans like to keep some uh, what they call memento mori. Um, the, the, the jewelers would make jewelry from uh, dead people's hair, you know, rings or whatever. Right. Yeah, that it's kind of gruesome, but at the same time, if it helps helps people deal with the loss a little more, then why not? I wonder why the for the TV series they wanted to do this instead of H.R. Giger. Maybe because they were afraid that there would be some kind of like phalluses getting through on the. <laughs> you know, that's that's not a bad uh, explanation. Maybe they couldn't get a hold of Giger. Maybe they they thought it would be too much to put on the show. Or maybe they just thought Final Frame was going to be more interesting because it's more gruesome. It's like, it's oh, it's pictures of dead people. I wonder if, if they filmed this and then didn't put it on. It, that would be a really good question, I think, for Stephen Jones. Yeah. Well, we'll put that on the the, the list of questions yeah. if we get a hold of him. So, um, yeah. They did that. They did that in the 1800s with dead bodies. So very, very creepy. Um also, there's another thing that they did when they were taking baby pictures. And since you have a, a young boy, um, look up pictures of babies from the Victorian era, yeah. uh, from the 1800s. I mean, sometimes you will find pictures where the mother is turned into a piece of furniture uh, because wow. they wanted – they wanted the, and I'll explain what I mean, is that the baby – had to be in the mother's lap to stay still when they were taking the picture. And so if they just wanted a picture of the baby, sometimes they would put like uh, a blanket or something over the mother and turn her into kind of like a chair. <laughs> and she'd just be holding the baby under the blanket and the baby would be like sitting on top of the blanket and they would take a picture. And you will find these really weird pictures where you can tell that there's a lady under that blanket and she's just holding the baby. And it's 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 hilarious sometimes. It's really funny. Jeez. Yeah. Coming up next, we're going to be talking. About, we're going to be doing a Hellraiser Bloodline audio commentary. Uh, we had planned also to have a Hellraiser Judgment audio commentary by now, but nobody knows when that movie's coming out. So we're going to just keep on putting it off until we can actually see it. That's right. So um, okay. we we. We promise we'll suffer for our art and we'll watch Hellraiser Judgment. Again, it could be good. It could go either way. I'm not going to say anything without seeing the movie. But, um, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to the Bloodline. And maybe we'll get Rob to come back for uh, the Bloodline docu um, commentary track. Yeah. And then after that, we'll be doing um, part three, which is um, GHI of the mm -hmm. A to Z of horror. And we'll talk about the duels of blood again. Yes, so uh, get cracking on round two of the voting, and you can still vote today until 8 p.m. Alaska time on round one. So there are still some of these who are just barely winning for one vote. I mean, yeah. the, things can still change, even though after this episode is up, you know, there may be a few hours of voting left. So definitely some of these matchups that only have one vote of difference, they can totally uh, twist. Yeah, yeah. So voting is over for this round, but uh, by the time you're listening to this second, you'll be into the second round and, and be able to vote again. All right. Well, that's that's awesome. And thanks for listening to us, and we'll catch you uh, on the next episode. And this podcast, having no beginning, will have no end. 
can find the show notes for this page and lots of Clive Barker news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the Send Voicemail tab on the right. Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at Occupy Midian. Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, Pocket Cast, Google Play, and Double Twist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.